Illinois Pioneers continues with a look at the history of Parkland College, coming up next on WILL. In the early 1960s, a group of educators and business leaders in East Central Illinois began discussing the need for post-high school vocational and technical education. At about the same time, the Illinois legislature was creating the mechanism for establishing a junior college system. In 1966, local voters overwhelmingly approved the creation of Junior College District 505, the fifth junior college of the modern era in Illinois. District 505 is now known as Parkland College. And tonight on Illinois Pioneers, we'll take a look at the remarkable 45-year history and growth of an institution that has become an integral part of our community. Our guests are Rachel Schroeder, the first full-time employee hired and longtime assistant of the Parkland President and Board of Trustees, and Dale Ewan, who started as a math teacher and concluded his career as Executive Vice President. Thanks to both of you for being with us tonight. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about Parkland here in the next half hour. Dale, let's start with you. When did you start at Parkland? I started in 1969 in the fall. It was the third academic year. I was a mathematics faculty member, and then uh, a few years later, I became a mathematics coordinator, which is sort of equivalent to department chair. And uh, in 1987, I was encouraged to go into central administration as a vice president. And so I had 17 years as a vice president when I retired in 2004. And most of that time, I was the chief academic officer. I think we have a picture of a much younger Dale Ewan to take a look at here in just a moment. But what are some of your memories of interviewing for Parkland and, and getting that, uh, that foot in the door? Well, it, <clears throat> it was a very exciting time, obviously. Uh, the, the junior college, or now we refer to as community college, was very in its, in, in its infancy. And so, the faculty were very excited. There were, there were no uh, catalogs or books or whatever uh, for many of the courses, especially in the, in the career programs. And so it took a lot of energy and a lot of uh, working with advisory groups, especially in the vocational and technical areas, to come up with courses to meet the needs of students in those uh, career areas. And Rachel, you were the first full-time employee hired by the new Parkland District. Yes, I began work in October, on October 24th of 1966 on a part-time basis and uh, then uh, went to full-time on January of 67 when Dr. Starkle came. And there you are with Dr. Starkle in oh, those yes, early days. very dated picture. <laughs> <laughs> Could there have been a better founding president for Parkland than Dr. Starkle? I can't imagine. Uh, with the background that he brought to the college, uh, he seemed like the best person they could have ever found. Um, he had spent six years in, as an educational consultant with a large consulting firm out of Chicago. He had been a superintendent of schools in California and in Nebraska and started out as a high school teacher and as a coach and uh, just a tremendous amount of experience. Dale, do you recall your first uh, meeting with Dr. Starkle? Yes, the day I interviewed, uh, I went in to meet him and he was very excited about Parkland and about uh, all the things that needed to happen. Uh, I like to say about him, he had a wonderful vision about what Parkland ought to be and he was, uh, got the buy-in of the faculty. There, were, there was very little dissension about the overall mission of Parkland or what we ought to be doing and uh, he was able to communicate that vision and everybody got on board. It was, uh, it was a very exciting time for all of us. And an exciting time for these gentlemen on the screen right now. That's the first Board of Trustees. Uh, you worked with them, of course, Rachel. Uh, let me identify them. Uh, D. Wayne Nywold from Loda, Charles Ziprote from Urbana, Norman Weller of Hinesboro, William Froome, the chair of the board, was from Champaign, Douglas Hager from Gibson City, C.W. Barnes from Monticello, and John Matthews of Tolono, the group that uh, actually uh, hired Dr. Starkle and, and got the ball rolling. 
That's right. And the remarkable part about um, the board is the fact that they come from different areas of the district. And in the beginning, um, at least two of them had to be from, I believe it was five from incorporated and two from unincorporated. And so fortunately to this day, that area representation has been maintained. And the thing that strikes me about the Board of Trustees at Parkland is that there are a lot of members who have served a very long time on the board. Yes, yes. The presidents, uh, I'm fortunate to work for three presidents, have always had a good rapport with the Board of Trustees. Well, I'd like to add, I think one of the mm -hmm. strengths of Parkland over its entire lifetime has been a very dedicated, excellent Board of Trustees. It's very important. Let's take a look. When Rachel, when you went to work for Parkland, this was the office. And That's it was right. in downtown Urbana. It was, it was. It no longer exists, but uh, we had a three room office on the second floor of the Empire Building. Down on the first floor, there was a, uh, a medical doctor. It housed a beauty shop and it also housed an insurance company. And so we had three rooms on the second floor and eventually got a fourth room before uh, we moved to Champaign. And then I think we, uh, the next picture we have actually is a, a picture of uh, the moving equipment and uh, getting things set up uh, for the first administrative offices downtown when the campus started to be created down there. Very exciting because as I look at that picture on the second floor, um, that's where the administrative offices were located. On the first floor, um, the library was located. Now we'll be looking at a number of pictures of different buildings in downtown Champaign because the campus was spread not only in downtown Champaign but in other buildings around uh, the, the area as well because there just wasn't enough space. The, the, the interesting thing there was that it was approved in 1966 and the first class opened in September of 1967. That, that's a timetable that's hard to even imagine. Oh, it's it's mind-boggling when you stop and think that not only all the faculty had to be recruited and hired for all of those programs, but then as I said earlier, there was, there, there, most of the courses had to be developed from scratch. And so uh, there was a lot of work going on and I'm certain that uh, the f during the first semester, the second semester courses were being developed. <laughs> it's just that tight. Yes. Well, I, I did note I I in uh, researching the program that uh, the faculty for the first several years was on an 11 month contract rather than the typical nine and a half month contract because they were spending their time developing the next semester's courses. That is correct. Let's take a look at uh, the next picture, which is kind of iconic. I think uh, many people may have seen versions of this before. This is the registration line at the Student Center. Uh, this building has since housed uh, several restaurants, but uh, it, when the students came to register, Dale, they, it, it's not the typical registration process here in the early days. It, it almost worked backwards. Right, in the early days, uh, after we were in quarters in, and so and about the, the uh, middle of each quarter, students would have to fill in a sheet of paper that indicated what courses they wanted to take the next quarter. There was not a schedule ahead of time. So you would submit the courses you wanted to take, and then by magic in the, the computer center, they would generate a schedule that included all the, the uh, classes that the students wanted to take. And then you'd get your printed schedule in the mail or you picked it up. Uh, now after that point, the schedule was posted all over the place and you could still make some fine adjustments. But uh, in most cases, especially in, in many of the career programs, there was only one section of each course. So your schedule was pretty much determined uh, when you got that uh, uh, initial schedule. And here's uh, the image of the computer center. We see the uh, key punching into the old cards, a stack of cards down there on the, in the foreground. That uh, Those folks worked late into the night to accomplish the registration process. All the time. And uh, when students would register, they would go through uh, with their schedule that they had gotten. But to complete the registration, they'd go through different lines and they'd actually pick up 
uh, one of those computer cards, and when they picked them all up, then at the end they actually submitted them, and that's when they registered is when they turned those in and they paid their fees. Let's take a look at some of the early enrollment figures. Uh, Parkland <coughs> opened with 1,338 students. The fall semester of 1973, which was the first at the permanent campus, was 3,668 students. And then a big jump to uh, almost double just two years later once people settled into the new campus. And then in 1981, all the way up to 9,300 students and, and things sort of uh, leveled off there for a little while. But that's really, Rachel, remarkable growth for this institution. Yes, it is. Um, initially, to start out with 1,338 students, after uh, you know Dr. Stargold just began his employment January 2, and then nine months later, um, and then everyone was looking forward to moving out to the new campus where we would supposedly be all together, be under roof anyhow. Um, and more programs began to be offered and uh, just a booming time. Take a look here at one of the other buildings in downtown Champaign that, that housed some of the students. This is the old Gregory School that uh, went full circle and once again became a school. See a couple of the students there in the foreground. And uh, take a look at the next picture as well. And that's the Jefferson Building, which recently was converted to condos. And uh, one more picture here takes us inside the churches around Westside Park. The downtown Champaign churches provided a lot of classroom space in the early days of Parkland. And uh, Dale, tell us a little bit about what you see in this picture that kind of stands out. Uh, well, <clears throat> a lot of fond memories. Uh, we had classes in the Presbyterian Church, in the Methodist Church, and the Episcopal Church. And these, these were their Sunday school rooms. And if you notice on the right, you see the small little uh, children's ch chairs and table. So what would happen is on the weekend, they would come in and, uh, well, after classes on Friday, they would come in and they would take the, stu uh, the college student chairs and stack them over in, in the end and then put out the Sunday school chairs for, the, for Sunday. And then uh, Sunday evening or early Monday morning, whenever, uh, they would uh, switch them back and forth. Uh, but most of the uh, traditional classes like mathematics, English, history, and so forth, would have all been taught in these rooms, or many of them. Now the next image shows some of the pedestrian activity in uh, downtown Champaign, the computer center, that's where the new parking garage is, if I'm remembering things right, but a lot of pedestrian traffic because there was no place to park. That's right, parking was uh, very, very difficult. With that number of students, as we showed earlier, uh, obviously lots of people walking around trying to find parking. Many of us would have to rent spaces behind uh, houses, on uh, alleys, different places where people would be renting space to, to faculty at least, and then students would be uh, negotiating and competing uh, for parking space on the streets. Uh, I might add that the computer center building there also had the automotive program in the basement, and there was a ramp. You can't see it from here, but there's a ramp. That it was very tricky to get a car down uh, to the lower level where they taught automotive for a while. When that program uh, grew, they, we moved it out to uh, Edgebrook uh, near Kmart at the time. I think that building actually uh, was a car dealership at one time previously in its history. I think that's right. <laughs> the, uh, let's take a look at the next image, which is the interior of the student center. You see the uh, and the basic furnishings that were uh, moved in for the benefit of the students, so they had some place to rest between classes because they're, uh, again, we, the parking was an issue. And uh, we'll go to the next image and show that that student center was used for a lot of things. They uh, kind of crammed uh, 
the, the choir in there for, for this performance. Our counseling and other student service uh, offices were also in that building. Very busy building there on the corner. And uh, the University of Illinois had uh, a role, uh, the association goes back to the, the even way in the early 60s. But if you look at the next uh, image, Parkland had an advantage that some of the other junior colleges didn't in that because you were here with the university, there was a, a Plato lab. It's kind of interesting when you look at Parkland's and, and the university's uh, history together, uh, there's been a, a marvelous partnership there throughout the entire period with all the uh, different presidents at both institutions. Uh, it's interesting that with the Plato system, it was a benefit that we were able to enjoy. And so there would be times when we'd be testing equipment and programs and so forth, and our faculty would actually work with the university uh, personnel in developing the, 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 uh, the uh, lessons. The next picture here we'll look at briefly just shows a young couple going into one of the the downtown Champaign buildings that uh, served Parkland so well during that interim time. The new campus was built on the side of a farm. We'll take a picture, uh, take a look at the picture of the Ehler farm here. And uh, the, if you look carefully, the, the corn crib and the barn still exist in the southwest corner of the Parkland campus. The house is gone, but Rachel, uh, Mrs. Ayler was not really excited at first about selling the family farm to Parkland for the site of the new campus. No, that's very true. She wasn't. Uh, most people who live on farms and grew up on farms are very protective of the farm ground and want to keep it in their families. And um, she was not initially uh, thrilled with giving up her home. But she came around and became a, a fan Eventually, of Parkland. Yes. Mm -hmm. But again, part of that uh, farmstead is still there on the campus. A look at the next picture. It was time to start developing the plans. That's Dr. Starkle with uh, Dale Sprankle, who was the project architect, and Ernest Kump, the principal in the firm that designed the campus. And it's my understanding, Rachel, that the, the Kump firm uh, designed a lot of junior colleges, particularly in California. Yes, they did in California. They had also designed two other colleges, uh, community colleges in the state of Illinois, Rock Valley Community College in Rockford and Illinois Valley Community College in La Salle, Peru area. Um, Dr. Starkel, when he was a superintendent of schools in Arcadia, California, and uh, received his EDD from Stanford University, um, I think he was exposed to the Kump architecture uh, when he lived out there and uh, the number of junior colleges that they had. Take a look at the next picture and we're looking at uh, the master plan for not only the Parkland campus, but for what is now Pick Dodds Park at the top of the screen there. Uh, and the, uh, really from, from where Parkland draws its name, uh, because the joint project with the Park District and with Parkland. Moving to the next uh, photo, there we have a model of the campus. It wasn't built exactly like this, but this is kind of a cons an early concept for the campus. And uh, I think there was discussion about uh, melding the prairie, the exterior, and the interior, that this was not to be an institutional-like campus. Right, right. And some people, even when they look at it today, refer to it as maybe a Swiss village um, with the different pitched roofs, and um, it's just a beautiful campus, a beautiful functional campus. Take a look at uh, the next image which uh, is a drawing of uh, the architectural drawing that looks more familiar to those of us who uh, visit uh, Parkland. And you see the trees prominently in that photo. And Rachel, th that's not an accident. 
No, it isn't. Dr. Starkle loved trees, and when trees were being planted, he didn't want just small trees planted. He wanted to have some growth on them uh, because it was like he'd love to have instant trees, but we know that they take many years. But um, many of the trees did have several years' growth on them when they were planted. And our next image, construction finally gets underway. There's the, the ironwork for one of the pods. It was built in what, four pods initially? Yes. Correct. And Be we'll Before we go on, I sure. forgot to mention something earlier that I think is very important. When we were downtown, many of us were, and the college was growing at a such great rate that we didn't have space. So they were what were called the science annex, which were uh, a, a series of buildings out in West Springfield where science, uh, nursing, dental, uh, electronics, and other uh, science programs were. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, when the automotive program outgrew what was in the basement of that building, they built, uh, we rented some space out on Edgebrook near Kmart. And part of the interesting thing about the scheduling of all that, when you stop and think about it, that was a challenge. So what they did, classes downtown started on the hour, classes on West Springfield started on the half hour, and classes at Edgebrook started on the quarter hour. And they were buses, and obviously students also drove, but you can imagine the amount of traffic and the students moving to and fro, because if you had a, a class uh, in, the, in the science building and then you had an English class downtown, that would create uh, quite a bit of traffic. We'll take a look here at the, uh, the ironwork, the uh, skeleton of one of the original uh, four pods, and then we'll move ahead to the next image, which <coughs> shows the, the four pods being constructed. What's missing there is in the middle. The, the, the center area was not built initially. It followed very quickly. Right, they did it in two, in two different bids or two phases. So the four, what we call wings now, uh, were uh, initially built, as you can see there, and very soon after this point, uh, the bid was let and approved for the student center, which connected these four uh, wings. Move ahead to the next uh, image quickly, as time is drawing short. There we are inside as construction. You can see the angle of the roof reflected there as uh, I think probably members of the Board of Trustees are, are getting a look at what's going on. We'll move ahead to the next image, which was an aerial photograph of the campus from about 1979. You can see how the parking was distributed and uh, not just acres and acres of parking lined up one row after another, but even the parking areas in Little Pods. The next image shows some of that, uh, I would say, perhaps California influence in, in the, the fountains that are part of the campus. The move in the summer of 1973 was interesting in that the bids came in too high to use professional movers. So what they do, Dale? Uh, well, they hired uh, several custodians and others to, uh, temporarily and some permanently because obviously they also needed to add uh, more uh, custodians for the new building because there's lots more space that we had downtown. And so uh, they and uh, f uh, various faculty and others just basically helped move it. Uh, obviously lots of equipment to move from all those career programs as well as chairs and desks and file cabinets and everything else. It was a major, major undertaking. Take the look at the next image. There's one of the lecture halls, quite different than those classrooms downtown. And finally, one more image to take a look at here, and that's a contemporary aerial photograph of the campus. As as you, Rachel, look back on your career at Parkland, what are you most proud of? I think I'm probably most proud of the fact that, um, first of all, I was employed by the board and was able to uh, spend my career at Parkland. Uh, I was there almost 34 years, and it's wonderful to go to work each day and enjoy what you do and know that it's making a difference and the opportunities that are provided for the community. And Dale, 
you had a long and varied career. What are you most proud of? Well, there's really two phases. One, it was a lot of fun being a faculty member in the beginning and working with everyone to build the curriculum and the programs uh, best to serve students. It was a very exciting time. Many people came uh, their first job, uh, and many came and with the idea, well, this is a good place to start. Well, you know the punchline. They stayed and made it what it was, and being part of that was very, very thrilling and important. And then when I became a vice president and I had the pleasure of working with Salima Harris uh, and the faculty and the department chairs in really moving Parkland to a new level in terms of technology and uh, curriculum development and so forth. And I'm really proud of all of those aspects and being able to work with all the people that I w have been able uh, to work on in my 35 years. We appreciate both of you being here this evening and helping us look at the history of Parkland College. Our thanks to Rachel Schroeder and Dale Ewan for sharing the history. As we continue our look at 150 years of Champaign history, join us next time for a discussion of the African American community. Sharp-eyed viewers may have noticed that I'm not John Paul who hosted the first nine episodes of Illinois Pioneers. Don't fear, John's still around. He's a full-time instructor in the College of Media at the University of Illinois, where he'll be training the next generation of broadcast and multimedia journalists. Indeed, uh, he contributed to the preparation for tonight's episode. So until next time, I'm Rick Atterbury. Thanks for watching Illinois Pioneers.